A couple of weeks ago, I had the opportunity to volunteer at the Minnesota State Fair, and it's a fantastic state fair. We're very proud of it here in Minnesota. With the Minnesota EV Owners Group, I got the opportunity to volunteer in the Eco Experience Building, which is all sorts of things for improving your home as far as energy efficiency and electric vehicles. You're seeing some of that B-roll right now. And in the course of that, I was going to do a normal video and just walk you through that whole process. But meeting a couple people, one that was full of very fast-paced questions and one that was full of FUD, those people convinced me to do a different style video today. So I've got Ellen here with me. She is going to give me fast-paced questions. Some of those questions came up at the State Fair and others I found responses to articles about EVs online. So I did compile this list, but she's going to give it to me out of order. I haven't seen it for a few days and I'm going to try to answer in 30 seconds or less. So this is quick fire, frequently asked questions about EVs. Let me have it. So where's the engine? The engine is really two motors generally. There's a motor between the front set of wheels and the back set of wheels here on this Model Y. And then the batteries lay below everything in a skateboard fashion. What about winter? I heard they don't work in the cold. Okay, so they do lose a little energy in the cold, but it's not as bad as it's made out to be. Worst of the worst days here in Minnesota when it's 20 below, blowing snow, and things are really bad, you don't precondition your battery, you could lose up to half of your charge or half of your range. But that is extremely rare. You will lose a little, maybe 20 to 30% on a general cold day. That's below freezing. The rest of the time, it's really not a problem. Don't you have to park it outside? No, you don't have to park it outside because uh, there was concern about battery fires with the Chevy Bolt a year ago. They did a recall, asked people to park outside. But electric vehicles have a much lower fire rate, although there's a much higher rate of publicity if a battery electric vehicle does catch fire. So we charge it inside our garage with the door closed. And in winter, we can keep it closed, keep it war warm it up in the app while it's still plugged in and get better range in the winter. So it's a great benefit and getting car kids into cars with the garage door closed in the winter and the car warm is fantastic. So what happens when the battery needs replacing in a few years? Uh, batteries should last the life of the car. There are, just saw a post yesterday about uh, a Tesla with over 200,000 miles. So some of them have 300,000 miles. So they generally do really well. If they were to fail, in the first eight years or so, that's within the battery uh, warranty time. And so the company would just take care of it. So generally you're not gonna have any problems with batteries. At the end of their life, they can be recycled. I was just gonna ask you, aren't they going to fill up landfills and contaminate groundwater with the dead batteries? If you just threw them away, yes, that would be a problem. But there's a lot of valuable material in the batteries. And, you know, a lot of concerns with electric vehicles is, you know, the mining and all that stuff that goes into making them. But once you have a pack, you have essentially really high-grade ore. And so at the end of their life, the batteries are shredded and will all those chemicals and elements will be separated and put into new battery packs. I heard they're not better for the environment than gas cars. Initially, that is the case. It takes more energy, materials to make the battery pack and everything to make an EV. However, at about 50,000 miles, they equal out. And after that, it's all gravy in the favor of the EV because the gas cars will always be burning gas and there's no other options. The EVs will use energy more efficiently, even if they're powered by coal and natural gas and, and other fossil fuels, they're using that electricity more efficiently and big plants can make an energy more efficiently than uh, a gas engine in a car. So it's overall a better use of energy and the grid can get greener over time, whereas gas is just gas. Why do they have funny door handles? A lot of cars that are EVs do have funny door handles. We're starting to see that in ICE vehicles as well, but it's for efficiency. It's that little bit of drag that they cause. They like to keep them flush in a lot of the newer models just to 
cut down on wind drag, give you a little more efficiency, maybe a few more miles. Can it drive itself? Not without supervision, but it can do some amazing things. A lot of modern cars have uh, cruise control, adaptive cruise control, and some sort of lane centering. Teslas do have a thing that's called full self-driving. There are other things like drive pilot or pro pilot that are also assistance features. You have to pay attention and make sure you're in control of the vehicle, but this car can, on the beta program, take turns in city streets and things like that and drive on the highway, but you are still in control, but it's pretty cool. Why don't they swap batteries instead of waiting to charge? Uh, there is a company that does battery swaps and that is done mainly in Japan, I wanna say. I'm blanking on the name of the company, but uh, they have battery swap stations. And if there's no line, you can get in and out in about five minutes, get a new battery. And you essentially rent your battery and they just pop a new one in there. That's great, but in a country as large as the U.S., it's not really practical to have stations with 50 to 100 batteries just sitting around fully charged, waiting for people to show up and swap them out. So I don't think that's really gonna take, take over in the US. Are there any affordable models? Yes. Uh, Teslas have gotten a little out of whack as far as uh, pricing goes, and those are kind of the thing people think of when they think EVs. But the Chevy Bolt, I think, starts in the uh, high $20,000 range, and the Chevy Bolt EUV is similar, also starts in that twenty-five dollars to $30,000 range. So those get about 259 miles of range, so are pretty good. The Volkswagen ID.4 is in the mid-40s. I know that's getting up there in price. The Tesla Model 3 rear-wheel drive is also relatively affordable for EVs, but we do need those prices to come down. What's the cost of charging at home and on the road? On the road, our average cost of supercharging is $11.33 as of our road trip this spring. Prices have gone up a little bit, and so you, know, you might be looking at an uh, average stop time of $16 at a supercharger now, but that is fast-paced charging. At home, the charging is probably closer to $5 if you were to do a big charge. But most of the time, you're only using 20% of the battery in a day, so you just need to top that little bit up overnight. Did you need major upgrades to add a charger at your house? We didn't need to do anything as far as upgrading our panel or anything. So that was pretty easy. We just had an electrician put a NEMA 1450 plug, kind of like a dryer plug or an oven plug, in our garage. Once that was wired up, we just used the mobile connector from the car to plug that in every night and haven't had any issues in four years. For the wiring run and insul installation, it was about $615 and we got a $500 rebate from our power company. And so total cost to us was about 115 bucks. That might be rare, but that's what our situation was. I've heard you can't tow with them. A lot of the cars can actually tow, and the Model Y you can get a tow package with, and it can do, you know, the regular garden trailers, the, um, you know, your boat, jet ski, that kind of thing, if you have them. Uh, we didn't opt to get the tow package because we never tow. The trucks can tow quite a bit more, and there are some great videos of people towing Airstream trailers and things like that uh, with the Rivian pickup truck and the Ford F-150 EV. So what happens when you run out of juice? Uh, if you're on the road and you run out of juice, it's just like running out of gas. You pull to the side of the road and you're out. Uh, unfortunately, there's no get real gas tanks for electric vehicles, so you would have to get a tow truck or use one of the new F-150 Lightnings. If you've got a buddy with one, that can come and pull and charge you up with their 240-volt uh, plug in the back. But generally, you're going to be looking for a tow truck. But the cars do a great job of planning and letting you know when you're low and when you really need to stop and get a charge. With road trips, do you have to stop and charge for eight hours? No, most of our road trip stops are 22 minutes, and some of that is because of our daughter taking a little extra time. So if you're traveling with children or pets, you're going to be stopping for about 15 to 20 minutes anyway. Some stops along the highway can be as little as 7 minutes, 
and others can be up to 40, 45 if you're in the middle of nowhere and really need to go a long distance. But most of the time you're traveling for a few hours, then charging for 20 minutes, and then traveling for another couple hours. What do you think of Elon Musk? He is his own worst enemy and says some very dumb things on Twitter and makes jokes that he thinks are funny but aren't funny. But I think overall he's a net positive. He has dragged the auto industry kicking and screaming into making real efforts into making electric vehicles and transitioning that. Also a lot of battery storage and solar is coming through Tesla. And with SpaceX, he has given the United States a lot of savings of uh, not having to pay Russia to get our astronauts up and down from the International Space Station. And also been the lower lowest bidder on a lot of defense contracts that are going to space. So saving taxpayers money there and not leaving a bunch of boosters in the ocean by reusing boosters and having them land on the drone ships and bringing them back. They aren't littering the waters off of Florida with a bunch of extra space hardware. Why are the charging spots at grocery stores so close to the entrances? A lot of times the power for buildings will come in from the back near the loading docks. And in those cases, the further you bring the power out from the uh, back of the building is the longer electrical runs you're going to need. And all of that obviously costs more money. So a lot of times it's cheaper for property owners to put the charging places near the entrance. Some of them also like to look more green by having those near the entrance so everyone can notice. Is it dangerous to charge in the rain? Absolutely not, but it is weird your first time doing it. Everything's well sealed. There's no issues. I've never heard of anyone having a problem with it, but obviously we're, we've got that in the back of our mind, and it's weird the first time. Why don't they put a generator on the wheels so that they can keep the battery full? That seems like it might make sense, but there's no free lunch. And so if you put a wheel on the wheels to power an alternator and then power the battery. You're just adding losses by more drag on the wheel, adding losses within the alternator, and that's really not an efficient or realistic way to do it. What EVs do use is regenerative braking, and so the motors will slow you down. Instead of coasting, you'll get that power, and that regenerative braking does go back into the battery. So you do get a little bit back in those cases. And that means you're also saving your brakes by having the motors do the bulk of the work. And so brakes last for a very long time on EVs. Can my Hyundai charge at a Tesla supercharger? Not quite yet. Tesla is in the process of opening up the supercharger network to other vehicles. They've started that process in Europe. And I think in the next three months, we're going to hear quite a bit more from Tesla about that happening here. But Tesla, when they started rolling out the Model S, there wasn't a real standard for plug type for fast charging. And so they made their proprietary plug and rolled with it, and it works great. But now there is a charging standard, which is the CCS standard. And so Tesla may be moving to that in the next couple of years. New superchargers will probably be built with that on. And I expect an adapter to come within the next year for CCS vehicles to be able to charge at the supercharger network. So big changes coming in the next year. But as of right now, CCS vehicles can't charge at a supercharger. Thanks to Ellie for the Q&A help, but before I go, I want to share a couple other observations from the fair. My shifts ended at 9, so a lot of the exploring I was able to do was after dark. So most of this b-roll will be nighttime. But first I want to give a shout out to the Minneapolis Polestar team. They are at every car show and every ride and drive event, and are out there getting butts in seats. At the fair, they had a Polestar 2 in our area, and another in the XL Energy Electric Garage. Likewise, aside from the Mach-E and Lightning in the Eco Experience building, Ford's main show area had these vehicles front and center. In the past, it seemed like EVs were crammed in the back or non-existent. I was really impressed that Ford used their prime real estate to showcase the Lightning and the Mach-E GT. Very cool. Around the corner was the GMC booth with some Hummer EV banners, but no truck. A friend said it had been there for part of one day, but only dealers were able to get close to it. The regular public wasn't able to get access, which is a bummer, 
for the Hummer. I understand they're very expensive, but if they're big and tough, it seems kind of lame to keep people away. I never did find the Chevy booth, but apparently they had a Bolt and Bolt EUV on display. And as I showed earlier, VW had the ID4 at the electric garage with Excel. In the booth, we also had a couple charging units for help illustrating how easy charging at home or on the road can be. There was also a computer and a monitor showing plug share, which was really helpful in explanations, but most people just want to see if there's charging around their home or cabin. I'll put a lot of the resources we discussed down in the description below, so be sure to check that out. And these are just my impressions of an overall great experience with the State Fair, and I can't wait till next year. Now, back outside. Thank you to Ellie for joining me, even though we forgot to record the audio on the last time we tried this, but uh, thank you for your patience. Thank you for watching. If you have any other questions, feel free to leave them in the comments below. I'll do my best to give answers. If I got anything wrong in the, this process, I'll try to correct it with B-roll or text on the screen. So thanks for watching. Like, share, subscribe if you enjoyed this. Have a great day. Happy road tripping. And I'll catch you in the next one. Thanks.